$10,000, which was what the budget was then in the 50s, the message was the same then as it is now. Know what stirs your passion. Figure out what needs doing to achieve it. Figure out how to get there and then go for it. And, and that's really been, I think, the mantra of my life. Let me tell you just a little bit about that job that Tom mentioned when I was community affairs director. The job really was to teach potential viewers that there was a channel 15 on ultra high frequency or UHF. There were only two UHF stations at that time, channel 39 and channel 15. 39 at one point was sold to NBC. So I would actually go to people's homes. I was so trusting. And I would ask for a wire clothes hanger. I would straighten it out, bend it into a semicircle, and then touch each end to the small ports at the back of the 1970s era TV sets. And voila, Sesame Street. <laughs> we knew at that point that we were on a roll. I mean, I couldn't get to every house that needed help, but I got to enough. Um, as Tom mentioned, I also began the, uh, the magazine, I began the membership campaign. But what was going on in the community was just too exciting for me to ignore. It was the early 1970s Vietnam era, and it was a fiery time on the campus of San Diego State. And we at KBBS witnessed that turmoil and it started to be reflected in our programs. As public affairs director, my new title, I went with my passion, with the blessing of the KPBS management, bless them to this day, that feminist movement that Tom mentioned. We worked with the Junior League of San Diego, and God bless them too. They got us some money, and we were able to do some documentaries on some issues that had been ignored in the 70s, the second-class citizens that women were in religion, uh, the effect of incest on children and teenagers. And we started to feel excited about our potential. From there, we dipped our toe into national programming. We kind of, well, you know, we can do this for local, we can do it for national, too. And we got a series of state and federal grants Perhaps the one that Tom and I worked on together in the most intimate way was something called Parent Effectiveness. And it was based on Tom Gordon's Parent Effectiveness training. My poor sons grew up with Parent Effectiveness. They were called eye messages. It wasn't, you know, you left your room in a mess, for God's sakes, go clean it up. What it was is, I feel uncomfortable because your room is not something that makes me feel okay about walking into it. They survived looking at this but I think that the, the one thing I do remember from Parent Effective is we shot it in Tom's apartment, we shot it in my house, was who we hired to do it. I'm going to wait because you don't want to miss this. <laughs> she was an 18-year-old, was just graduated from one of the high schools in San Diego, and we hired her for her first professional job. Her name? Annette Benning. Oh. Yeah, I know. I know when I think about that. Um, the other thing that was firing up the nation at the time was the California dream. California was the golden state. California had all these marvels. And we went in on that. We, we went ahead and got a, uh, a grant, and we produced a series of programs about California. These weren't programs. They were interstitials. They were meant for program breaks. And we did things like, in the old days, they had the Elizabethan dancing on the green of the old globe. Uh, there were the California missions. Uh, of course, there were the magnificent views of, of the port. And we photographed all that, made them into interstitials. Um, one of the directors, or maybe the director, Russ Carpenter, what, did, what award did he get, Tom? Uh, he got the Academy Award for Cinematography for Titanic. Yep. He was the one, I wasn't sure about this, so I'm checking. 
the Academy Award Russ Carpenter for cinematography for Titanic. And he was the director on this, so you know it was really good. Uh, we also did shows for the Nightly Business Report. Nightly Business Report is still on KPBS. And we did field pieces about San Diego business, uh, raising Arabian horses in San Diego, uh, the devaluation of the peso and what it meant to businesses at the, the border, at the profit in party boats in San Diego Bay. When we have time, ask me about some of those stories because behind the scenes stuff was much more interesting than what we put on the air. <laughs> but San Diego was changing and it was growing and it was clear that our focus should be local. So for the next 20 years, we concentrated on local politics. My Special Love, the ballot series. In the 1980s, we interviewed just about every candidate who ran for any local office including the primaries. And I just got a blog today, a, um, it, w it was sent to me on Facebook or something like that, saying, um, um, I'm defending Gloria Penner and whatever she does because she had me on television when I was running in this sort of uh, amorphous race somewhere in the county and she asked me really fair questions. And that was 25 years ago, 30 years ago. But that's the whole point. These were important times in these people's lives. There are people who decided that, that they were willing to risk something, to go out and run for office, and we recognize them. Occasionally, I meet one of them in the supermarket or on the street, and I do discover that that appearance was their life's highlight, never to be forget, forgotten. But then there were surprises. Um, Lock David Crane was the perennial mayoral candidate. His mom just died, Claire Crane. And uh, in case you didn't know, she was a professor of history at San Diego State. He shook me up. I had all the candidates for the mayoral contest, we still have a picture of that, lined up. And I went with the microphone. I went from candidate to candidate. They were all sitting behind the, the podiums and um, asked him a question. When I got to Lock David, he took out his wallet and the darn thing exploded. Great fire coming out of that. And he was using that to illustrate how the city council was burning up our money. <laughs> uh, I thought that that was the most, but he was uh, not as outrageous as a not very stable but very young candidate for Congress. Is Don Johnson here tonight? No, okay. He was part of that whole thing. Uh, who refused to give up his briefcase that he was carrying onto the set with the other candidates. And just when the camera was on him for a response, he opened up his case and let out a rat. Now, this was to illustrate his contention that Congress was full of it. The crew chased the rat. My guests never flinched. They just sat there as the rat was running around them. Then the rat found the control room. And that's where chaos ensued. But the show went on. The, the forerunner of the Editor's Roundtable started in the early 80s with the Reporter's Roundtable. It had many names. I think it ended up being called San Diego Week. And several folks are here tonight that were on that early series. So would you stand up, please, if you were on that early series of KPBS's Editor's Roundtable? OK. Uh, there we go. Oh, look at that. Thank you. Um, however, there, there's one person who isn't here tonight, and I really should say that the, uh, the reporter's roundtable got him started. It, it's Gene Cubison, and Gene is willing to admit that he switched from print to television after he was on the roundtable on television, got the bug, and I encouraged him. I say, you know, you, you've got the face and the voice. You really should do TV, and he switched over. So whenever you speak to Gene, remind him that I was responsible. JW, I'm, I'm reminding you too.